You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. So they'll put the belt of truth off, forget about it, I like this instead. We're seeing that happen. And so believers that aren't being taught the Word of God, they don't spend time in the Word of God, they're subject to this. See, Jesus said, you'll know the truth. And when you know the truth and you've got that belt of truth on, that truth will set you free. And there's a liberty and there's a joy in Christ. But what Satan does, he'll come with subtle lies so that he rips off your joy. And he rips off your liberty in Christ. You found a unique and beautiful rock gleaming in the sun. But then your sibling came and covered it up with dirt and you couldn't find the rock anywhere. How cruel. Something so beautiful was then hidden by the dirty ground, nowhere to be found. This is what Satan tries to do with his lies. He tries to cover up the truth, the good, the beautiful things that God's doing. Pastor Ron clues you in today that this is intentional on Satan's part, trying to rip you off, away from the truth, stealing your joy. Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of Acts chapter 19 with today's edition of Larger Than Life. We can't go into the world trying to fight the enemy in our own strength. I think of the seven sons of Sceva, We read this story in Acts chapter 19, and uh, Paul was preaching in the realm of Ephesus, by the way, of which he is writing this book, but this is in Acts 19. And God was doing mighty works through Paul, and there were seven brothers who actually saw Paul cast demons out of people. And they thought, well, that's amazing. We'd like to do that. In fact, we think we can do that. And so what they did is they proceeded to copy what Paul did when he was casting out these demons. And so they came up to this demonized guy, and I'll read it in Acts 19, 15. They, they start doing this. Hey, we tell you in the name of Paul, Jesus, name Paul, come out of this guy. And the demon says, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? Then the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them, overpowered them, prevailed against them, so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. Now here's the thing. These guys weren't wrapped up in the truth of God's word. The fact is they weren't even Christians. So they tried to defeat the enemy in the flesh. The point is this, if you go out into the world without girding up the belt of truth every single day, even as a Christian, you're gonna fall. Number four, I believe putting on the belt of truth speaks of total commitment, total commitment. When a soldier girded up his loins, when he cinched up his belt, he was saying, I'm ready to go to war, I'm ready. Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. I think I Instagrammed that, tweeted that, Facebooked that, did all that today, that verse, that was all that stuff. But I love that. When I'm, when I'm wrapping myself in God's word, when I'm taking the time daily and I'm saying, Lord, and I'm praying this on, I'm like, Lord, I need to be wrapped in your word today. I need to be prepared for today. What I'm saying to God is I'm ready for battle. I'm taking you serious. I'm taking the battle serious. I'm ready for battle. I like that. And and then Paul, of course, tells me to fight the good fight of faith. Now, why is it a good fight? Well, it's a good fight because it's a fight for what is right, for the kingdom of God. It's also a good fight because we win. Fight's always good when you win. Just, you know, you know that, right? And we're going to win the enemy. We're more than conquerors in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 37. But the point is this, the believer who had his belt on is saying, I'm committed, I'm ready to go. One poet put it this way, fight the good fight with all your might. Christ is your strength, Christ is your right. Lay hold on life, and it shall be your joy and crown eternally. And what I get from that is that I'm putting on this belt, I'm not taking it off, I'm ready for battle, and I'm not gonna take it off until I go to be with the Lord. This is my closest companion, it is my Bible. It is where I learn about my Lord, it's where he gives me instruction, I'm wrapped up in God's truth. So. We would say it's four things. It's our foundation, it's our security, it makes us battle ready, and it speaks of total commitment. That gives us a little bit of what Paul was talking about when he says, put on the belt of truth. D. Martin Lloyd-Jones summarized it this way, great words. He said, the belt of truth speaks of a mastery of truth, but also being mastered by the truth. This is the thing that binds me and holds me together. It puts me on my feet and gives me vigor, strength, and power. It means that its truth gets a hold of me and it governs my whole life. Do you get the picture? I hope you do. So that's the believer's belt. That's the belt of truth. Now, I kind of want to turn a corner then and talk about the believer's bout. We talk about our belt, but let's talk about our bout. And what I mean by that, we're in a battle, right? 
But there's going to be a battle specifically concerning every piece of armor and why we need it. And there's a real reason why we need this piece of armor because enemy is going to come really strong at this piece, at the Word of God. So I want to give you a few areas that are a few ways in which Satan attacks our belt of truth and why we need to have it on. And I think there are four or five, I'm not sure. But number one, Satan attacks the Word of God by seeking to get us to question the Word of God and even challenge, in doing so, the character of God. If our greatest strength is trusting in God's Word, in this belt of truth, then Satan's going to do everything he can to distrust this belt, to not put it on. And he'll, he'll try and get us to say that, well, God really isn't trustworthy. So he'll tempt us to doubt God's motive, God's will, God's counsel. Satan wants to convince us that really this belt of truth isn't all that. And he specifically attacks us in these areas when difficulty hits our life. That's one of his greatest strategies. It happens most when tragedy strikes, when a young one dies of cancer or is crippled for life, when a family loses their mommy or daddy in a horrible accident, when someone's health fails, or when someone goes through bankruptcy. You can fill in the blanks. Now, things like that happen to believers all the time, and they've happened to a lot of people in our own fellowship, some of you here. And when that happens, what Satan does is he tries to come to the believer and pervert the truth of God's Word. You see, the Word of God tells us, when I have my belt of truth on, the Bible says, all things work together for the good for those who love God. So, God, I don't understand when this happened, but you've told me in your Word, this is for my good. And Satan will come to that person and say, well, yes, that's true. Most things, but in your case, not this one. I mean, because after all, how could a God of love have allowed that to happen to you? And what he's trying to do, he's trying to get you to distrust God by impugning the very character of God as revealed in his word. Because if you can get you to question God's veracity, then how could you hold to any of it in the Bible? It's either all true, it's all not. And this is exactly what Satan did in the garden. Remember, God told Adam and Eve, hey, you can eat of all the fruit, of all the trees in the garden, except for this one. Don't touch this one, because in the day you do it, you'll surely die. And so Satan comes to Eve and says to her, Genesis 3, 1, has God indeed said, is, is that really what God said? Are, are you sure about that? You see, God's holding out on you. That's what God's holding out on you, Eve, because he knows that if you eat that, you'll be like God. He's, he's just holding out. He, that's not true. So what he did is he got Eve to question the credibility of what God had said. Well, the reality is, of course, they both got thrown out of the garden because of their sin. Jesus said in John 8, Satan is the father of lies. So he'll come to us in times of difficulty and get us to question this belt of truth. And that's why I need to have the belt on. If a Christian doesn't, isn't wearing their belt, doesn't know God's word, they're subject to that. But if I've got my belt on and I'm wearing it every single day and I know about this belt of truth, I'm saying, no, that's a lie. What a lie, Satan. First of all, all good things do work together for the good. But not only that, I know Jeremiah 29, 11, that God's thoughts toward me are peace. And God wants to give me a future and he wants to give me a hope. That's God's heart for me. So, I realize as a Christian when I've got my belt of truth on that God is too loving to be unkind. He's too wise to make a mistake. So in his grand scheme, he's allowed this. And I'll trust in him. He's never let me down. Secondly, Satan will attack God's word through false doctrine. Satan seeks to pervert the truth, but he does it in such a subtle way. He'll give a lot of truth out, but just a few lies mixed in there, you know. It's what Paul calls in 1 Timothy 4.1, the doctrine of demons. Satan will pervert God's truth with subtle lies. And unfortunately, a lot of believers fall for it because they don't have their belt on. In 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3, Paul said, the time is going to come when people are not going to endure sound doctrine. I have to tell you, the time has arrived. We're living at that day and age. And according to their own desires, they have itching ears. And they'll heap up for themselves teachers who will tell them what they want to hear. And they'll turn their ears away from the truth, and they'll go after fables. So they'll put the belt of truth off, forget about it, I like this instead. We're seeing that happen. And so believers that aren't being taught the Word of God, they don't spend time in the Word of God, they're subject to this. See, Jesus said, you'll know the truth, 
And when you know the truth and you've got that belt of truth on, that truth will set you free. And there's a liberty and there's a joy in Christ. But what Satan does, he'll come with subtle lies so that he rips off your joy. And he rips off your liberty in Christ. For example, let me give you a few examples. You got a new believer. They're walking in their newfound faith in Jesus Christ. They're just excited, you know. Ah, so good to walk with the Lord. And all of a sudden, another Christian says, Oh, uh, where do you go to church? Well, I go thus and thus so on Sunday morning. Oh, oh, Sunday morning? Oh, you didn't know? You're not supposed to worship the Lord on Sunday morning. You have to do that on Saturdays. You're, you're breaking the Sabbath. Oh, I, I didn't know that. That happens. Or there's a Christian, they're enjoying their freedom. They're just, man, God is so good. And, and the person comes up to, well, do you speak in tongues? Uh, why no? Huh? Oh, you didn't know? You're not really saved unless you, you speak in tongues. You didn't know that? that? That's the deeper life. You have to be able to do that. Or let's say a believer gets really sick. In fact, there's a believer who has cancer. Believer gets cancer, and they're meditating on God's word, seeking to get truth from God's word, but someone says, wait a second, you have cancer? There, there's something wrong, because didn't you know that God, God's will is that you be healthy? that you not be sickness, and so there must be sin in your life because you're ill. Or you have another Christian who's maybe struggling financially. Maybe it's a single mom trying to make ends meet, and she's just trying to walk with Jesus. Another person comes over and says, well, why don't you got a fancy car? What's, why are you struggling? Don't you know that God expects you to have prosperity? Man, if you were really following the Lord, you wouldn't be going through all that, you see. See, what happens is Satan comes with these subtle little false doctrines to get the believer off, and in doing so, rip them off of their joy, rip them off of their liberty in Christ. And here's the thing. If you don't have your belt of truth on, you fall for it. People do all the time. So false doctrine, number one, attacks God's word. But secondly, it attacks the freedom and the joy of the believer. That's why Paul, back in chapter 4 of Ephesians, in verse uh, 14, said that we should no longer be children. Understand, it's an immature believer that falls to these things and teaches those things, by the way. We should no longer be children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men. And yet it happens. And why does it happen? Because Christians don't have their belt on. And they end up going from church to church looking for the new vibe, looking for the new feel, you know. But here's the thing. Only God's word will satisfy only God's word satisfies the hungry believer. And so it's no coincidence that most believers who find themselves tripped up in false doctrine don't read their word, the word of God, their Bibles regularly. And let me say this. When I say reading God's word daily, you read it systematically. And you know that. If you've been coming here for any length of time, you know that. But I need to say that. That you, you, you don't want to use the turn and point method. You know, we're like, well, what am I going to read today? Oh, that's awesome. Ezekiel. Ezekiel, the long lion nations like a monster in the sea bursting forth rivers. I don't understand that, but that's going to minister today. I know it is. Probably not. So you want to read systematically. Each verse is part of a paragraph. Each paragraph is part of a chapter. Each chapter is part of a book. Each book has a theme. A reason is written. And when I read it in context, there's power. And then I can understand how to apply it to my life. So you want to read through the Bible, the reading books in the Bible systematically and go through all the Bible. Now, if you're a new Christian, I always say, why don't you start in the book of Matthew and go through the New Testament, then go through the Old. But regularly, as a believer, you should be going through the Bible on a regular basis. Just regular basis. I, I go through every year. And I use different methods to do that, to keep it fresh. But you're going through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And you're getting the whole counsel of God. And what you're doing is you're wrapping yourself up then the belt of truth. And that's going to keep you from false doctrine. We know that there are churches that don't even teach all from the Bible, right? And that's a problem as well. A good way to know if a church is on target is you, you should be able to tell if something's wrong if you've been there several weeks or let's say a month and it's the same thing week in and week out. In other words, it's all faith, 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 faith. Or it's gifts, 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 gifts. Or it's healing, 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 healing. Or it's giving, 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 giving. If it's just they, they just beat this one certain drum all the time, you know, there's a problem. You see, when you teach and you go all through the Bible, you're learning, you're getting the whole doctrine of God, and it keeps, you, it keeps you grounded. And of course, that's why we do it as a church, and that's why we need to do it individually. Now, let me say this. Warning. There's a warning. On the, you should probably have a warning on your Bible. Warning. Reading this will change your life. And uh, it will. And, and reading it 
will bring on attacks. And also, let me say this, the enemy will also do this. You start reading your Bible regularly, and the enemy will always say, you can't understand that. That's too deep for you. you. Leave that up to the professionals. Listen, as I said, this is the first book I read all the way through. You know what? I, some of the stuff I didn't get, but I just kept reading. And I'll tell you what, I got a lot. God spoke to my heart an awful lot. And I found myself so encouraging. What I didn't know, I was learning more from going to church and talking to other believers, but I was growing. But back on target, Satan attacks God's word by attacking God's credibility and character. He does it through attacking our word, our God's truth with false doctrine. He also, here's another tactic of the enemy, he attacks the truth of God's word by attacking its sufficiency. In other words, uh, Satan will attack the believer, and this happens all the time, by saying, you know, if you have a problem spiritually, you s- go to God's Word, but it's really not sufficient for everything. Now, the reality is God's Word is the rudder for my life. It's my foundation. But the enemy will lie to us and say, well, yes, it's good for some things, but when we're talking about all the complexities of life, you might need a professional. If you've, if you've been abused or you've been an alcoholic or you've been a drug problem, you need a clinical professional. Now, that's not to say that there aren't Christian professionals that can help you in this area using the truth of God's word. That's different. The point I want to make is this. Satan will do everything he can to keep you from this book because he knows this is where you're going to gain wisdom and insight for everything. I mean, David said in Psalm 19, 17, the testimonies are sure, making the simple wise. And then he said this in Psalm 119, 100. Because I understand God's word, I know more than the ancients. In other words, I know more than all the counsels of the word. And here's the point. The believer who isn't wearing the belt of truth will fall prey to the subtle lies of the enemy that says, well, really, God's word isn't sufficient to meet all your needs. You need to go to other people to get help. I don't believe that. In Colossians 2, 3, it says this, in him, that's Christ, and in the word, are hidden all of the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Not some, not most, all. It's right here in God's word. 2 Peter 1 and verse 3 tells us he has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. Listen, I truly believe that one spoonful of God's truth from God's word is more life-changing than all of the wisdom of all the counselors in the world put together. Truly, God's word. But that's why Satan will attack it. Fourthly, let me say this. Satan will attack God's word by saying it's full of errors. It's full of errors. It's, an, it's errant, right? There's problems with it. I like what Roy Allruck said. He was right on. He said this. So true. He said, Satan doesn't waste his ammunition professors, these are college professors who are being paid to teach philosophy and English and biology and math, often take time from their class periods to undermine the Bible and Christians. By the way, did you know that's true? By the way, did you know that 80% of Christians that graduate from high school and go into college, 80% fall away from the Lord? 80%. That's why we are very aggressive in our fifth and sixth graders, junior high and high school, to present apologetics, to talk about why we believe, the the reasons why Jesus Christ is true. So when they go to college and some professor, some know-it-all, stands up and says, well, the Bible isn't true, you stand up and say, no, I don't believe that. If that guy's going to teach something that has nothing to do with the subject in his class, then you stand up as a young person, say, I disagree with you. Here's what the Bible says. Well, you're going to... Anyway, back to the subject. Why do these professors, he say, not do the same thing with other sacred books and other religions? The answer, he says, is because Satan, the original liar, is sympathetic with books that lie. I love that. His real enemy is directed against the book of truth because it contains the dynamite for his defeat. This is God's dynamite for Satan's defeat, for us as believers. That's why we want to be wrapped up in it. But Satan will try to undermine it through all kinds of people, all that kind of stuff. So we're in a bout with Satan, and we need to be wrapped up in God's word. Why? Number one, because he'll attack us to question God's character and God's credibility. Secondly, because he produces false doctrine by the truckload, by the truckload. Listen, there are even Christians and pastors in the church that hold up their belt. They hold up the belt and say, I believe in this belt. I'm going to teach this belt, and they don't teach from the belt. You understand what I'm saying? We're in the Bible belt, and we're lacking in regard to the belt of truth in the Bible belt. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. 
But there's false doctrine. That's why we need it on. We need to have it on because Satan will lie saying that God's not sufficient to meet our needs, but when you have the belt of truth on, it is. And number four, we need to do that because there's all kinds of people trying to shoot holes in it all the time saying it's not sufficient. What a lie. What a lie. We need to have the belt on. 2 Kings chapter 22. Here we read a story about a king. His name was Josiah. And, and the kings before him had so disregarded the temple itself that the temple was left in ruins and they hadn't been reading the Bible for so long that finally this godly king, Josiah, says, you know what? We need to get right with God. Let's clean up the temple. And while they're cleaning up the temple, they find the law. They find the book. They said that we found the book. And they began to read the book. And they were kind of blown away. And they brought the book to the king. And the king read the book. It was the law. And he tore his clothes. He says, oh, my goodness. What are we doing? You see, for decades, they hadn't even been following God or worshiping God. Man, he said, we're in real trouble. We need to start doing what's in this book. And if you read the rest of 2 Kings, you read there, there was revival because they came back to the truth of God's word. And certainly that's what we need as a nation, right? Yeah. We're told in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, they will pray, they will seek my face, and they will turn from their wicked ways. Then God says, I'll hear from heaven, I'll forgive them their sin, and I'll heal their land. But all that happens, every great revival in the history of church has come as God's people pray and they get back to the book. So we need to wrap ourselves up in God's word. And here's the thing, not just reading it, but doing it, right? James talks about being doers of the word. So let me begin to wind up our thoughts with this. H.P. Barker wrote this. He says, I was looking out in the garden one day and I saw three things. First, I saw a butterfly. It was beautiful. And it would alight on a flower and flutter to another, but only staying for about a second or two and not deriving a whole lot of benefit. Then I watched it a little longer and there was a botanist. And the botanist had a big notebook under his arm and big magnifying glass, you know. And he'd lean over a certain flower and he'd look for a long time and he'd write lots of notes. And he did for hours writing notes. Then he closed it, stuck it under his arm, tucked away his magnifying glass and off he went. The third thing I noticed was a bee, just a little bee, but this bee would alight on a flower and then he would sink himself right into the flower and he'd extract all the nectar and all the pollen that it could possibly carry. It went in empty every time and every time came out full. And then he said this, there are a lot of Christians, first of all, like the butterfly. They just flit from verse to verse to verse ever so lightly. Don't take a lot in. Others, he said, are like the botanists, right? They come with a magnifying glass. They're taking lots of notes, right? Ah! They close the cover, never put it into practice. Others are like the bee. They dig deep into God's word, and then they seek to apply it. So I suppose in closing, as we've been talking about the belt of truth, which are you? Butterfly, just flitting from verse to verse, really not putting on the belt of truth a whole lot. Or you put on the belt of truth, you like the botanist, man, this is awesome, it's cool stuff to know, but not really doing anything in it. Or like the bee, I mean, really in God's word. You're putting on the belt every single day. You're wrapped up and you're saying, Lord, I want to live this. Help me to live it. And, and when you are, when you're living that way, you're going to be wise to the attacks of the enemy. Now, there are a whole lot more attacks, right, than just the ones we've talked about. That's why there's a whole lot of more pieces of armor, six more to be exact. But here we have the belt of truth. That's the foundational piece. Just as the belt was the foundation to all the other armor, the word of God, gang, is foundational. That's why we're all about it. I've known people say, well, I used to go to Calvary Chapel, or I visited that church, but man, they just, they just teach the Bible. It's like, <laughs> that's awesome. Man, that guy teaches for 40 minutes or more or something. Awesome, awesome. That's what we needed. That's, that's our foundation. And we need to do that in our own lives. You can't rely on what I give you this is an encouragement time as we gather together and we're, we're pumped, but we need to have that daily time in God's Word. Do you ever wonder why you're here on earth? It might sometimes feel as if it's all too depressing and hopeless, but within the family of God, you'll find purpose that you never even dreamed of. You've been listening to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint. Pastor Ron is making his way through the book of Ephesians where you'll find so much purpose, you'll be bursting with it. Here's just one example found in Ephesians 2.10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. 
Not only do you have a purpose here on earth, but God also has gotten those good works ready for you ahead of time. He's just waiting for you to say yes and step in. And there's no better place to say yes than in a community of believers. Larger Than Life is a ministry of Pastor Ron Hint and Calvary Houston. Are you in the Houston area? We'd love to see you here next time you get a chance. We meet every Sunday at 9 and 11 in the morning and on Wednesday evenings at 7. You can find our location and answers to all your questions at ltlradio.org. Once again, that's ltlradio.org. If you can't make it in person, we highly recommend downloading our mobile app, which you can find on our website, or you can listen to Larger Than Life podcast to stay connected. And with that, join us next time on Larger Than Life.